So you might be wondering to yourself, how am I going to understand this poem when it's not even in English? Well, let's figure that out together. This is W. H. Auden's Musée des Bois. About suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters. How well they understood its human position. How it takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking dully along. How, when the aged are reverently, passionately waiting for the miraculous birth, there always must be children who did not specifically want it to happen, skating on a pond at the edge of the wood. They never forgot that even the dreadful martyrdom must run its course. Anyhow, in a corner, some untidy spot, where dogs go on with their doggy life, and the torturer's horse scratches its innocent behind on a tree. In Bruegel's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him, it was not an important failure. The sun shone as it had on the white legs disappearing into the green water, and the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing, a boy falling out of the sky, had somewhere to get to, and sailed calmly on. So this poem is quite confusing. It's broken up into two stanzas, and it can really be hard to grasp either one. Both of them start off pretty almost mysterious if you don't know what you're looking for. But one rule of poetry is to try and read the poem a couple of times, and that rule will help you out a lot with the first stanza. So let's take a look at those first three lines together again. About suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters, how well they understood its human position. So what I did here with the colors is just tried to show you that the antecedents suffering for its and the old masters for they are kind of separated from their pronouns. And that's what makes what would otherwise be a pretty understandable sentence a little difficult. If you were to rewrite this in prose instead of verse, you would probably write it as the old masters were never wrong about suffering. They understood its human position. So we're using basically all the same words, but we've put it in an order that makes more sense. So why is Auden writing in this sort of backwards order here? Well, there's a number of reasons a poet might take this approach. They might want to play with the syllables where they land for their meter. They might want to create a rhyme scheme by ending on a certain word. But I think the biggest thing Auden is doing here is he's putting suffering up front and center. It's the second word of the poem. If we wrote it the other way, it would be at the very end of that first sentence. So now it's at the beginning of that sentence. So if you followed this rule, you'll hopefully understand that suffering is the subject of our first stanza. And with that in mind, it becomes much more difficult, or sorry, much easier to figure out. Um, you might wonder who the old masters are still, and we'll get to that in the second stanza. So the rest of the stanza here uses a poetic technique known as juxtaposition. And juxtaposition is just where you take two things and you hold them up to make a point, create a comparison. So what I did here is I tried to color coat what's being juxtaposed. The first one is how it takes place. The it refers back to suffering. So suffering takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking dully along. So in this pairing, we see that while some people are suffering, other people are doing mundane tasks like eating or opening a window, or walking along in a boring fashion. So while some people suffer, other people have normal, boring days. The next pairing is the aged are reverently, passionately waiting for the miraculous birth. And this is just simply saying that people are excited about a child being born. Adults are sitting around and they're counting down the days till the birth of a child. Elsewhere, though, there are children who did not specifically want it to happen, skating on a pond at the edge of the wood. This is a pretty difficult two lines to figure out, but if you think of the image Auden is creating, children skating on a pond at the edge of a wood, and you know that the stanza is about suffering, then you can probably imagine what he's getting at. If you know it's going to be a sad movie, and you see children skating on a pond, you're pretty sure they're going to go under, right? So his pairing here is, in the first part, people waiting for this miraculous birth to take place, and in the other part, people who lose their children too early, perhaps the worst thing in the entire world. 
In our final pairing, we get Dreadful Martyrdom, which is dying for a belief, runs its course well in a corner somewhere, dogs go on with their doggy life, and the horses scratch their butts on a tree. So dying for your belief versus horses scratching their butts. Can't get much more opposite than that. But the point of this stanza becomes clear by the end of it, I think, that while some people suffer, other people just go about their business or live happy lives. And we kind of trade places where we are in life, but you don't know when the suffering's coming all the time. And sometimes you're having really good days, and sometimes you're having really bad days. And sometimes when you're having a good one, the person next to you might be having a very bad one. And that's what he's going to dive in more to in the second stanza. So in Bruegel's Icarus, we should pause right here because another rule of poetry is understanding every word of the poem. And for most readers, they're not going to know at least one, if not two of those three words in that uh, stanza already. So Bruegel, if we look him up, it is a name, you can see it's possessive, is Peter Bruegel the Elder, who was a key painter of the Dutch Renaissance, and he is also one of the old masters who understood suffering in line two of the poem. So that's how far away they're separated, and Auden's doing that on purpose. So if you don't understand who the old masters are, uh, you probably weren't supposed to yet, but now you can make the connection. He's an old master of painting. And here's his uh, self-portrait. So what is Icarus, though? Well, Icarus you might be familiar with. Icarus is a Greek myth about a boy and his father, uh, Daedalus, who are imprisoned in a tower. And Daedalus is an inventor, and he creates these wings for him and his son so they can jump out of the tower and fly uh, to freedom. But Daedalus warns Icarus um, not to fly too close to the sun because the wings are made of beeswax and they will melt. But Icarus does just that, and when they f escape, he takes his freedom too far, flies too close to the sun, falls into the water, and dies. So... For the Greeks, it's kind of a warning about the dangers of freedom, or maybe not listening to your parents. But for both Auden and Bruegel, that's not what they're getting at with this story. They're taking a different approach, and it's a very interesting approach. Um, so you might be wondering, well, what is his Icarus? What is Bruegel's Icarus? Um, well, we know he's a painter, so you can probably assume it is a painting. And in fact, that's what the rest of this stanza describes, is a painting. So this poem is known as an ekphrasis, which is a poem about a visual piece of art. Uh, Keats created a number of famous ones, both um, on reading Chapman's Homer and um, uh, Ode on a Grecian Urn. But Auden's uh, Musée des Bois is perhaps the most famous ekphrasis of the last hundred years, so which is probably why you're reading about it in school or somewhere <laughs> right now, and I'm talking about it. So let's look at this painting. Um, I want you to think about it. The painting is called Landscape with the Fall of Icarus, and imagine in your brain what that would look like, a landscape with Icarus falling from the sky. I'm wondering if you envisioned this because I sure didn't the first time I heard about this painting, because you would imagine a painting about the fall of Icarus would probably have Icarus in it, and this painting does, but he is quite hard to find. In fact, you have to look in some untidy little corner, as Auden points out, right here is Icarus. So instead of being front and center, he is tucked away in this little corner, and we might be wondering, why is that? Well, it's really cool because 400 years apart, Bruegel and Auden are getting at the same thing, and it has to do with what that first stanza said about human suffering. Look at how many things from this painting you can see in the poem. We have the dog with his doggy life. We have the horse. We have the plowman. We have the sun. We have the white legs, Icarus's legs, and the green water. And we have the expensive, delicate ship. So clearly we can see that Auden is looking at the painting in order to create the images of his poem in words, um, as opposed to Bruegel, who used paint. 
So the other interesting thing about this painting, other than Icarus being tucked away in the corner, is the composition of it. And think about where your eyes first looked the first time you saw this painting. It was probably up because the bright part of the painting is at the top, not the bottom, and to the left because both the horse and many of the people and the ship are all facing or moving in that direction. So Bruegel is taking our eyes away from Icarus. Instead of putting him front and center, he is in this tiny corner and he's encouraging us to not find him. How does that connect to the first stanza of Auden's poem? Well, sometimes people are suffering, dying, even literally, and we don't notice it. We just go on with our lives. We're opening a window or walking along or scratching our butt or hanging out with our dog or whatever it might be, and we don't notice suffering right in front of us. And, and that's a very sad thing, isn't it? Um, and perhaps the saddest thing, because you can't notice all the suffering in the world, but when it's right there, when it's right in front of your face, do we sometimes ignore it because... Not that we didn't see it, but we had somewhere to be and we sailed calmly on. Great message to think about. So let's talk about lasting influence. Uh, major influence on writers, painters, and students. You can see it at the Musée des Bois in Brussels, this painting. Um, and you can sit where Auden sat when he composed it. And it's in a David Bowie movie. So that is like the pinnacle of... Um, <laughs> I've never seen that movie, um, but I mean, it's got to be the pinnacle of inspiration. But just as many, um, just as Auden was influenced by paintings, um, many students have now written poems about paintings um, because of him, which I think is quite cool. So if you have a painting or a statue or something you really, really like, uh, try capturing it in a poem. Um, follow Auden's footsteps. And while you're at it, pay attention to suffering and have a great day. See you next time.